Hi everybody, it's Franny, and since we have the new i8 in the garage, I thought it'd be really fun to do a comparison between plug-in hybrid and full electric. I borrowed this i3 here from our good friends John and Jen, and I think it's going to make a really neat comparison against the i8. So what I want to talk about really are the different types of electric cars that are out there. We've got the plug-in hybrid over here, and then this is a full electric with a range extender. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about this plug-in hybrid. And so what does that actually mean? It means that it's got a hybrid of drivetrain. So it's got an electric motor up front and a gasoline engine in the back and that's coupled directly to the rear wheels through a transmission. So the engine can drive the wheels directly and then the electric motor is up front for assist and efficiency. So that's the way a, a, a hybrid works and this is a plug-in hybrid which means that we can actually plug in and charge the battery before we go. It's a small battery on this car, 7 kilowatt hours and it only has about a 15 mile range or so which isn't isn't that great but that's it's more about efficiency and the coupling of the two powertrains on these hybrid cars so how is that different than this car well this car the i3 is a full electric car which means it doesn't have a gasoline engine coupled to the wheels in any way now this particular version does have something called a range extender which is a small gasoline engine but its job is only to charge the battery so it's coupled to a generator and the interesting bit about that is in, in sort of city driving, when you're not really going super high uh, speeds on the highway or trying to head up these huge mountains here, the range extender little engine can keep up. The generator can keep up with the amount of power required for the car. But if you go too much, it, 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 it really can't quite keep up. It's really just literally to extend your range a little bit. It's kind of an interesting thing. So this car really does rely on its electric motor and its electric battery. So that's the kind of the difference between the two technologies here. It's, they're actually very different. Let's start by talking about the i3 here, completely electric car. Now, both of these cars, the electric kind of world is really coming of age. This is the beginning of 2019 when we're shooting this. And I think in the 2020s, as we go on, you're going to see a lot more of these really coming of age. Battery technology is getting good. And uh, we're getting to the point where you can charge these things in a short enough period of time. They're becoming very useful. So at any rate, uh, there's some massive uh, pluses on these full electric cars and one of them probably at the top is the least amount of emissions it's really nice however you want to slice it you can say well you know they've they've got a long tailpipe because of the power uh, how power is generated whether it's coal or whatever but in the end these cars still have the lowest emissions when you put them up against a gasoline ICE car so that's one big huge plus the other is that they have um, probably the lowest maintenance because they're very simple cars. They, I, th I like to think of them actually as external combustion engines because they've got an electric motor and their power is all set and ready to go inside the battery when they drive off. So they have, they don't have to convert their energy really. So they don't have that many moving parts. They've got the electric motor. Some, some of them have a bit of a transmission and they have the same drivetrains. Of course, you don't have oil changes. You don't have to worry about uh, engine servicing and all that. So that's actually a huge plus, I think. That makes them very low maintenance. And because they don't have that engine banging around in the front or the back, they're actually pretty quiet. They're very quiet. So all you're hearing when you're driving down the road is really just sort of wheel noise and rolling noise. So they've also got a pretty simple drivetrain. A lot of them pretty much just have drive. You're not worried about shifting gears on these cars because they generally don't have any type of shiftable transmission on them. So that makes them much more simple to drive and just kind of easier and lower tech. They also have this kind of cool thing where you can drive them almost with one pedal. Since these electric cars have um, regenerative braking built into the whole systems, when you let off of the gas pedal, that sort of engages and it really slows the car down. So when you become adept at driving these cars, you can almost drive it completely with 
just the throttle, just the gas pedal, which also reduces the amount of wear and tear on the brakes. So that's also a very positive thing, I think. Another thing I'd like to say about the electric design is it can be very custom in the way it's designed. These, these cars, you can put the battery pretty much anywhere. You can put the electric motor up front. You can put an electric motor on each wheel. They're very configurable. So a lot of times the uh, internal space on the car is much larger than it would be in a normal gas engine car. And you don't have this big lump up here or in the back where you'd have a big engine. So you get a lot of extra trunk space as well. It's kind of neat the way you can just completely reconfigure it and really helps to kind of rethink of what a car really can be on the road. I think that's pretty neat too. But with all of those positives, there are some drawbacks as well. And probably the biggest one that everybody talks about is range and range anxiety. And I won't go into that too much because it's been beaten like a dead horse, but uh, the car's range is going to be dependent on the size of the battery and its efficiency. And like I said, in this case, this car has a range extender, so it has an onboard generator. So it can get a little more range even if the battery only, say the car can only drive 80 miles on a charge with a range extender, we can push that quite a bit further. So that's kind of nice. For me, the, it isn't range anxiety, it's more charge time anxiety that I think is the big issue. It's how long is it gonna take to get it recharged? A lot of people worry about how far you can go, but if you could go, just like with a regular gas car, since you can always just put gas in it, nobody really thinks about that because it just takes a few minutes to fill it up. These cars have, there's different stages to the charging. Stage one, which is 110 volt, you just plug it into your outlet in the garage. This is a stage two charge, and it will charge in half the time, but 220 volts, you have to get that set up in your garage. So there's a couple of little things with infrastructure and charging that you have to consider with this car, and so that can be a little bit of a drawback. And along the lines of charging, if you think about it, it really only makes sense if you're gonna charge this car at home to have a garage. In inclement weather, if it's gonna rain overnight or you're gonna have a bunch of snow, you probably don't want your car plugged in and in the driveway, and it certainly would be difficult to plug it in out at the street. In fact, the charger that we have for the i8 says that you shouldn't use an extension cord with it either. So you don't have to put an electrical outlet outside in order to plug the thing in. So it really needs a safe, warm garage to do its charging, and that, that could really preclude a lot of people from getting a full electric car, I think. Another small drawback with these cars is that uh, if you live in Florida or somewhere where it's warm all year round, that's fine. But here in Colorado, it gets pretty darn cold in the winters. And these batteries are very dependent on their temperature. So the amount of power they can put out drops dramatically, actually, in the cold. So you can see maybe 30 to 40% drop in your range. And you're also running all of your accessories off of that too. So you're running your heat, you're running your air conditioning, anything you'd be running inside the car has to eat off of that same battery. So that can really reduce your range. So it's something to think about in the winter time, you might get used to it, buy the car in the summer and say, oh, I can drive to here and back and do just fine. But then in the winter time, you'll find that, oh my gosh, now I'm kind of hurting for range. Um, so just something definitely to think about in these fully electric cars. So let's talk a little bit about the plug-in hybrid. So with a plug-in hybrid, we're able to plug it in and get some type of range on the car, maybe in this case 15 miles, but they can go up to maybe 30, 35 miles, something like that. So you see a, a truncated range. But of course, since you can put gas in the car, they have an unlimited mileage range and you don't have any of that charge anxiety or charge time anxiety or range anxiety or any of that because you can always just put gas in it. These cars are able to self charge themselves and that's really kind of a neat feature. So they, they're using the electric motor a little differently because it's not their primary source of propulsion. So they're using it for efficiency. These cars are literally a marriage of the two different technologies together. We have the uh, regenerative action from the from the wheels, which is great. So we can put our lost energy back into our battery and charge it up and then pull that back out. And the other cool thing about it is that the electric motor can be used to fill in where the gas engine is just a little bit 
it's just a little bit lame. So the, the gas engines don't put out nearly as much torque, it's slower RPMs, and when they're waiting for the turbos to boost up so the electric motor can fill in there and give you a much smoother power curve on the car. Because of the two different powertrains on this car, they can be configured independently or together, which is kind of interesting. So in the i8's case, this car can be front wheel drive if it's an electric, it can be rear wheel drive if it's running just off the internal combustion engine, or it can be four wheel drive if it's using both of them together. That's pretty cool. It's really interesting but it can also be kind of one of its negatives as well in that it's very complicated, this thing. It has a lot of different driving modes and it just has a lot of different ways it, it, it can be uh, configured to drive. So you really kind of have to think about what you're doing with this thing. It's not really so simple like the full electric was. We only had one mode, so you just kind of put it in drive and go. No, this has got multiple modes and all that sort of stuff. So it makes it kind of cool, but also makes it a bit more complicated as well. I want to talk a little bit about maintenance on the plug-in hybrid cars. Since we've got two completely different powertrains all coupled together on this thing, it gets pretty complicated. So the big maintenance issue on an electric car would be, of course, the battery. And on this car, it's warranted for about eight years, which is great. But on a Tesla, you know, you've got a big battery on that thing and they can get awfully expensive to replace. I think the replacement cost on this is almost close to $20,000. But they've seen pretty good reliability so far, so I'm not too awfully worried about it but you still have that gasoline engine back there as well. So you've got oil changes, air filters, anything that goes with a normal IC car, you still have that to do as well. So you got both. So in that ways, it's kind of a, a worst of both worlds. Whereas on the electric car, they're just really dealing with the battery, I guess, for a long-term maintenance thing on the car. Another thing about uh, having both powertrains in this car is that if you need to go to a, like if you're going to need to drive into a city center and they require it to be all electric or you get a huge tax break for that, that's great, but these cars aren't completely electric. So it can reduce the amount of benefit you get from the all electric. Now you can tootle around, but like I said, they have pretty limited range. This one's only 15 miles and some of the better um, plug-in uh, hybrids would be closer to maybe 30, 35 miles. And maybe that gets you through those areas, that's great. The, the cars can configure to save electricity and stuff, but once again, it gets a bit complicated with them. So uh, it's, a, it's one of the things when you're trying to merge, you're trying to be best of both worlds, but in some cases you end up having a foot in both worlds, which actually makes it worse in some ways. One final thing I want to say about the hybrid kind of technology and the plug-in hybrid is that with these two different power plants on this car, they can be configured for two different possibilities. In a Prius or a Prius, those, those cars are really configured for optimum efficiency, just like the electric car is. But then if you look at some of the highest producing and fastest sports cars in the world, they're going to be hybrids as well, like the 918, a LaFerrari, something like that. And what they've done there is they've taken the deficiencies of the gas engine and filled in with the electric. So they're not looking for 100% efficient driving and low emissions and things. They're really just looking to optimize performance. So that's an instance where the electric motor and the gasoline engine can be put together and really produce the ultimate car. So in conclusion, I would say that these electric and plug-in hybrids are really kind of the wave of the future, where the plug-in hybrids still have a little bit of a toe in the past with their gas engines and things, but the, and these might be a little more forward facing the full electrics, but it really is kind of the shape of technology to come. It's very interesting, I think. Now, another thing I looked at was some pricing between the two, because I was kind of wondering, I was figuring that the full electrics would be a little bit cheaper and these would be more expensive because of all the extra gobbins in them. But it turns out actually that the plug-in hybrids aren't that expensive. And there's a bunch of them coming out or uh, already out. And they're used a lot just to sort of increase the miles per gallons on the car and that sort of thing. But um, they're actually, for the, a comparable car, they can actually be cheaper as a plug-in hybrid than as an actual full electric. And that's I mean, the technology on these cars is all brand new. So that's one of the things that makes it expensive. 
some governments have uh, uh, subsidies and things that you can get uh, tax breaks and such too. So that kind of helps things along. I think that once you get to drive these things and feel that instant torque from the electric motor and uh, sort of the driving experience and all the different driving modes, and they just make for a very interesting vehicle. Well, I, I hope you like this. This was just sort of a, a quick little look at the difference between full electric and plug-in hybrids. If you did, please give the video a thumbs up. And I would love to hear your questions and your comments and everything down below. I, I just want to start a big discussion on this. I think it'll be really, really fun to hear all of your thoughts. So thank you so, so much for watching and a special thanks to our Patreon supporters. And we got lots more videos coming out. So uh, stay tuned. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, totally subscribe because we're going to have a lot more content like this. So thanks again so much for watching. And until next time, safe travels. Bye.